All right. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Martin Hansis, and welcome to my talk, which is titled, as you can see, My Game is a Joke, and I Demand to be Taken Seriously. Uh, first of all, sorry I couldn't be there in person. The wildfires in Canada and just travel being difficult as it is, I was unable to attend personally, but I'm very happy to get to present virtually. Uh, so, before I get into it, uh, I'll just do a quick introduction. So, like I said, my name's Martin. I'm a writer, I'm a narrative designer, and solo developer. I'm based in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, but I am originally from Finland. I'm Finnish. So, if you notice a slight accent, that's what that is. Uh, I started out doing a lot of freelance and contract work uh, many years back now. Uh, but my personal pet project and what I'm working on full-time right now is a game called Clam Man 2. Headliner, which is a narrative role-playing game about a clam that quits his jo office job to become a stand-up comedian. And that's why I'm doing this talk. Uh, just as a heads up, this is a very silly talk, I think. Uh, I've realized this more and more as I've been writing it and as I've been going over my own process, as well as thinking about what urged me to propose this talk in the first place. Uh, so it's going to be about writing comedy in games, uh, but even more so, it's about the experience of doing so. It's about kind of coming to terms with your own genre, which for me is is a thing that I've felt very ambivalent towards for a very long time. And uh, beyond that, it's also going to be a little bit more practical in the second half. I'll be going over some design and writing principles that's helped me throughout development of Clam 2, uh, which will cover more practical approaches to writing and messaging in games. I want to say that obviously every genre has its disadvantages, uh, its own kind of uh, strange uh, idiosyncrasies that you're going to be dealing with, regardless of you, if you work in comedy or drama or, or dating games or whatever. Uh, but what I'll be talking about specifically is uh, the biases that we hold uh, consciously and subconsciously about uh, comedy games. Hopefully, though, uh, this kind of approach will be helpful to you, even if you don't work in comedy or in comedy games specifically. Uh, before I go any further, I think it would be very helpful for me to define exactly what I mean when I say comedy game. So there's plenty of very, very funny games, obviously. Uh, I'd argue that one of the most successful funny games of all times, uh, commercially and critically, is Portal or even Portal 2 which has some of the cleverest writing and dialogue I've ever seen in a game. It's, it's incredibly, incredibly funny. At the same time, however, uh, Portal and Portal 2 are more than anything uh, puzzle games. They're first-person platform puzzle games, if you want to be really specific about it. And the reason I bring that up is uh, if you strip away all the narrative and all the writing in Portal 2, you're still left with a very engaging and interesting puzzle game. This same thing goes for Psychonauts, for example, which also is an incredibly funny game, has some amazing writing. But Psychonauts, when you look at it at the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay, is a 3D platformer, a collectathon, even. Uh, these games are comedies the same way Birdman or Little Miss Sunshine are comedies. They're not necessarily as dark as those two movies, but uh, when you remove the comedy, you still have a very engaging story in and of itself. And uh, when I'm talking about comedy games, and the way I'm going to be talking about comedy games for the remainder of this talk, uh, I mean games that, above all else, try to elicit an emotion in the player as their core design goal. They are specifically built to make the player laugh. Now, the way I see it, there are two distinct subgenres of the comedy game, if you will, uh, mechanical comedy and narrative comedy. Uh, but I thought it might be more reasonable to put them on a grid. So on, on one axis, uh, we have games on, on this side here. <laughs> uh, we have games that try to be as funny as possible as a central design code. So these are the ones that I call comedy games. Uh, they, they center their design around making the player laugh. On the other side, on this side over yonder, uh, you have funny games. And these are games that... Uh, are very funny uh, when you play them, but their core design goal is not to make you laugh. They just happen to be very funny or they're elevated by being funny. Uh, their core design is not to make you laugh. Uh, 
And on the other axis, we have the two subcategories that I mentioned earlier. So we have at the top, narratively funny. So these are games that are funny uh, because of the writing, because of the, the text, because of the voice acting, because of the story. And uh, below that, we have the mechanically funny games. So these are games that aren't necessarily narratively funny. They don't have fun dialogues or fun text, but playing them is very funny because of the mechanics at play. So for example, uh, Disco, Disco Elysium uh, is a very funny game. It doesn't try to be a funny game. It doesn't bill itself as a comedy game, but it has some amazing comedy in it. It's very, very funny at times. Uh, and it's also very narratively funny, which is why it's on the top left side of the screen. Uh, straight below it, uh, you've got Just Cause 4, for example, which also is not a comedy game at all. But if you've played that game, you know that it is very funny because of all the weird uh, kind of physics-based shenanigans you get up to in that game. You keep laughing at that game because of the strange things that you can do. But the story in Just Cause is not funny. Then on the other side, on the comedy game side, you have, uh, if you go straight from Just Cause to Trombone Champ to Goat Simulator, uh, these are games, especially Goat Simulator, that actively try to be comedy games. The, the experience is there to make you laugh, to make you have a good time. And uh, Goat Simulator, similarly, doesn't necessarily have a lot of funny narrative to it. But it is, when you play it, very funny, just because, again, of the strange kind of mechanical nonsense you can get up to. And moving up from that, uh, from Octodad to Stanley Parable to Jazz Punk, for example, uh, which is this uh, 70s expired or 60s inspired uh, secret agent kind of game, which is almost entirely uh, narratively funny. It just places you in situations constantly, in situations... Uh, both text-wise and world-building-wise, that are incredibly funny. Uh, so this is kind of a general idea of, of, of what I'll be talking about. And more specifically, since this is Narrowscope, I'm going to be talking about the top right corner. Uh, so, But a lot of this can still be applied to the mechanical aspect as well. So with all that out of the way, with these definition definitions done, uh, let's get on to the title of this talk, and let's figure out what being taken seriously really is. So, first of all, why do you want to be taken seriously? Uh, throughout this talk, I'm going to be making the point that comedy, in a sense, is an expendable genre. Or at least we perceive it as an expendable genre. I'm going to try to spend some time to kind of explain what I mean by that. It's a genre that we engage with in a very kind of passive manner. Uh, it's a want to be entertained above all else. It's, it's almost a type of media made for consumption. Sit down on the couch, in your chair, and just be amused. Laugh at things. Now, I'm not referring to that as a bad thing. Uh, not at all. Uh, but it, that does enable certain biases towards comedy and comedic writing in games that I think most of us bear with us consciously or subconsciously, uh, me included, which is why writing this talk has been such a strange experience. So an example I, I usually use when with regards to being taken seriously or, or comedy games gaining critical acclaim uh, is this. The Oscars, the Academy Awards, uh, and in 95 separate ceremonies or separate Academy Awards, out of 95 Best Picture winners, only seven are demonstrably or definably comedies. Why? Why is that? Why are there so few comedies winning the Best Picture Award? Why are there so few comedies receiving that kind of acclaim? Do we consider comedies lesser expressions of art? Are comedies less impressive cinematically or, or in, in games? Uh, do good comedies just not get made? Uh, or is comedic writing not interesting writing in general? Is it not uh, innovative and, and poetic and, and beautiful? Or is comedy and comedies just too subjective a thing to be considered the best picture? I think to some extent, uh, all of these are true to varying degrees, at least that we make the assumptions thereof. And as such, it's not representative of the whole picture. I think 
But the issue lies with how we deal with joy and laughter as an emotion and how capable of messaging we consider those emotions to be. Uh, specifically, how we tend to assume that high art comes out of pain. Uh, it comes out of negative emotions rather than laughter and joy. Negative is obviously a productive term to use it, but less, uh, less fun emotions, if you will. So, does that mean that having a good time does not make for interesting art? There's this common trope uh, of the pained artist uh, that it's, it's only through immense pain and fierce trauma that we can get deep personal expression. And I think this trope doesn't do us any favors. If you have a shit life and you produce amazing art based on it, it doesn't negate the fact that you still had a shit life. You've still dealt with these hardships. And it doesn't mean that you're moved out of this. You, you can still deal with all these horrible things and create amazing art. Uh, for games, it means that if you crunch on a game for six years, it could turn out to be an amazing game at the end, but you still crunched on it for six years. You still missed out on family gatherings, meeting friends, maybe sleep, maybe your health suffered. Now, whether or not that art you created was worth it, uh, that's up for to each and every one to decide for themselves. But I do think that there is a very general consensus that art that comes out of pain is more real and emotionally sound. That's because it, it allows us to relate and experience to the kind of the contained trials and tribulations of other people from a safe distance. And to be kind of really blunt about it, it it's almost voyeuristic. It, it allows the trust fund millionaire for a moment to get a window into the lives and experiences of the lifelong oppressed, downtrodden, and hurt. Now, obviously, at the same time, it can be very eye-opening to different perspectives and lived experiences for anyone. It can be an immense kind of learning experience just to kind of see what some people have to deal with and what kind of pain some people go through. And it also makes us feel less alone. It lets us relate. And there's a reason why there's so many uh, indie narrative platformers that's also metaphors for depression. And I'm not saying that uh, to make fun of them. I'm not trying to reduce that to something lesser. I'm saying it's very understandable that when you're hurt, it can help not just to express it, uh, but to see that other people are hurting too, either as an audience or as a creator. You are not alone. You took your pain, you took your trauma, and you made it something greater. And chances are, by putting it out into the world and letting somebody else experience that, they felt less alone and they felt better about it. And that's amazing. But does that mean that having a bad time makes for good comedy? Well, the short answer is yes. Yeah, it does. Some of the best comedies, quote unquote, deal with incredibly dark subject matter. Dark comedy in itself is a whole subgenre. And pretty much every other depressed person I know uh, will make awful jokes about themselves and their experience with mental issues. It, it is a way of coping and dealing with this, this terrible, terrible darkness. This type of media is highly acclaimed, for the most part, uh, for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. It's funny, it's sad, and it's it's utterly and, and completely human. But it's also not what this talk is about. This talk is more about whether or not light comedy, uh, if there is such a thing, is permissive of great art. We, we talked about the indie narrative platform as a metaphor for depression, can I make an indie narrative platformer that's a metaphor for how much fun I had at the theme park last weekend? It, it doesn't seem as likely, right? Now, the reductive answer there is that good times don't make for good art. But the more interesting question, and what we'll be going into is, why would that assumption be made in the first place? As a brief tangent, like I said, all genres kind of deal with this, and I think another genre that's growing in popularity lately uh, is wholesome games, which also kind of deal with the same thing. Uh, these are, are typically like pastel-colored farming simulators uh, with cute animals or cute characters that are meant to be relaxing and, and just enjoyable and for you to have a good time. But similarly, these games can tend to 
have problems receiving or or finding an audience in in uh, critical acclaim uh, they are also to some extent sometimes considered lesser the same way that light comedy is so since we're talking about genres uh i want to kind of look at the emotional engagement of comedy how do we as an audience engage with comedy and to do that i'd like to make a comparison between stylistic genres and specifically horror games and uh, comedy games now if you're not aware uh, horror is the single most prominent genre of games being made right now uh, if you look at steam metrics for example and it's huge especially in the indie scene comedy games as nebulous of a genre as that is is far from as popular and they only really pop up in in particular types of games, adventure games, and point and clicks. Now, the reason I want to make this comparison is because horror games and comedy games both try to elicit an emotion in the player, uh, fear and joy, or fear and amusement, respectively. There are plenty of, of horror games with, uh, and uh, I hope this doesn't sound as a reductive perspective on it, uh, plenty of horror games with minimal gameplay. What I mean by that is, Enter a haunted house, walk through haunted house, be scared, game over. Now, the core design philosophy of those games is not how do I make an engaging and innovative gameplay mechanic, but rather how do I scare the player? How do I elicit fear as an emotion? And I want to make it very clear that that's a reasonable approach to it. That you're making a horror game, you want to scare the player. That should always be your main objective. You're doing it right. But why aren't there more comedy games where you enter a funny house? You walk through a funny house and you laugh. Game over. Well, the difference to me is agency and interactivity. If I watch a scary movie, uh, for example, part of my experience is knowing I get no say in it. Someone will go into the basement, someone will do something incredibly stupid, and all I can do is watch and be scared. In a horror game, I am the one who goes into the basement. Base level engagement in a horror game is, is kind of wonderfully meta because it's me facing my fears. It's me fighting a core human emotion. And just by presenting an atmosphere and a world that scares the player, you're already developing interesting gameplay in that the player themselves is going, I don't want to go into the basement. I don't want to do this. This this is awful. I hate this. And then you go into the basement and you get scared. That's an incredibly strong point for horror games. You don't need to engage the player in complex mechanical gameplay, but you do need to make sure that the experience is terrifying enough that they engage with it as an actual threat rather than a system to beat. When I run away from an enemy in a horror game, it's not because I don't want to see my health bar drop down. It's because I am scared. I don't want to see that thing, whatever's chasing me. And that's a whole discipline and a craft in itself, and it's incredibly difficult to do. But in that same way, comedy doesn't work. Because I'm not fighting. I'm not overcoming anything. I am just amused. And that lack, then, of mechanical gameplay, if I'm just walking around an area, becomes painfully obvious. In a way, I think comedy requires more of a buy-in than horror, to some extent. You have to want to be amused and entertained. And this is where mechanical comedies shine, because the amusement comes from the player experimenting with systems in the world, in open box, physics simulations, that kind of thing, uh, rather than pre-existing bits of writing and world design. So they get to feel like they came up with the joke. They came up with the funny thing that they're experiencing. Uh, now there's examples of where this works. The Stanley Parable, for example, uh, arguably one of the most effective comedy games of all time, just in that regard. But that said, the Stanley Parable does ask the player to find their own fun, in a sense, uh, by actively trying to break and sabotage the narrative being delivered. Uh, that's why, if you remember the grid I showed earlier, I placed it right between mechanically funny and narratively funny. Because although the writing is very funny, the surprise and the the non-expectation of a joke comes from me trying to figure out how do I break this story. If I travel across on this platform, what happens if I jump off? And 
the joke comes out of the game saying, oh, well, we accounted for that. And there's a funny line that's being delivered to you. So having covered how we engage with comedy media emotionally, how do we engage with it as a genre? Uh, how do we engage with it critically? Uh, the same way we look at any medium for analysis. Uh, now, it is interesting to note, since we're comparing comedy to horror, that horror has had, or still struggles, uh, almost as much as comedy with this. It's only really recently that horror games have started to see regular critical acclaim, and uh, horror games are kind of slowly catching up to, to movies in that regard. Horror movies now are some of the most popular and, and critically acclaimed uh, that come out. But horror does have a leg up over comedy, and that is that it's an ex excellent subject for analysis. Uh, like I say here, anal anal analyzing horror is fun. Because fear can be derived from many things. But more often than not, we play on the fear of the unknown. There can be a shadow, an unseen monster, an unseen consequence, etc. Great scares can be had by forcing the player to make the assumptions themselves and imagine the worst possible thing. All that to say is that horror is the perfect genre for metaphor, for secrets, for subtext, for themes. Because these are all things that we love picking apart. And if you look online, there's a massive amount of articles, essays, and, and YouTube videos uh, of any given horror piece of medium that gives kind of the lore a deep dive treatment. But lore doesn't set up jokes. Comedy doesn't lend itself to this nearly as well. And my reasoning for this is, is twofold. One is that comedy as a genre and jokes rely on a set of rules and actual lived experiences and a subversion of those experiences. So opening the fridge door when you know there's nothing there, assuming somebody hates you when they don't respond to your message, airplane food is bad, etc., etc. And secondly, since these are crucially lived experiences, you can't establish deep lore to create new base for jokes. Now, in a horror game, I can create this entire world and this uh, sort of long backstory that explains the scares, that explains why they are the way they are, and, and delve into uh, themes and subtext of the sort. But lore doesn't set up jokes, like I said. Uh, I can't create lore to this extent without comedy, and and imagine that the audience will engage with that lore so deeply, uh, fully immersing themselves into understanding an entirely alien set of rules and systems that you can then subvert into jokes. And then finally, and I think this is the most crucial part in this comparison, when you pick a joke apart, the joke dies. Uh, there's a famous quote uh, by E.B. White, which is um, that explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog. Uh, you understand it better, but the frog dies in the process. Sometimes this quote is changed to uh, nobody's that interested and the frog dies in the process, which is ironic uh, just for me doing this talk in general. So comedy builds in all these experiences, like I said, but when we engage with these experiences directly, when we begin to kind of explain the joke and we analyze the joke, it's no longer funny. So you can't set up a punchline with lore. You can only understand it deeper, but it doesn't elevate the joke itself. It dies. The frog dies. The joke dies. And that's kind of where the issue is, I think. The way we engage with art critically is by ripping it apart, by looking at every single piece and how they interact together. And when pulled apart, comedy will always be at a disadvantage. And I think there's a very inst interesting distinction that can be made here, which is that good horror, when dissected, is great. Good comedy, when dissected, is dull. Now, you might have an issue or something that's been kind of going through your head as I've been doing this talk, which is that there are plenty of comedies that do have strong underlying themes or, or messaging, even political messaging. And you might be saying to yourself, my favorite comedians are the ones that have a message. They have a perspective, they have a philosophy, they're social commentators, and, and they make interesting points with their comedy. Now, I can fully understand that, uh, 
But also, all comedy is political. Regardless of whether you want to target anything in specific with your joke, uh, you will. I hear a lot of people say that a joke will always offend someone, which I think is a silly way of looking at it. I don't think it's true, but I do think that all jokes involve subversion to some extent. And it's in the way you subvert these pre-existing ideals, rules, or systems that you're making fun of that you ultimately do become political. And I also think that uh, nowadays, especially, we become very sensitive to this kind of messaging in comedy. Uh, oftentimes, this kind of messaging uh, has a very, very divisive audience. You either hate it or you love it. And sometimes the extent of which you feel uh, feel that is based on how well you politically align with that particular brand of comedy. Now, in the world of stand-up comedy, this is called clapter, uh, which is that you're not necessarily finding the joke that funny, but you agree with the point being made, so you laugh or you clap, hence clapter over laughter. Now, you might be fine with this, and it might not bother you at all, and that's fine. That's okay. You can enjoy this comedy. You don't need me to tell you that it's lesser or, or greater uh, because of that. Uh, but personally, writing comedy, I want to avoid that as much as possible, both because I don't feel like I've earned the laugh, but also because the audience oftentimes can tell, uh, either in good faith or in bad faith. Uh, and that kind of ruins the pace. Making a statement very clearly in a comedic context or inside of comedic writing in a video game it can just feel like you're making a statement rather than a joke. And personally, again, uh, my own personal experience with this and feelings towards this and that is that I'd rather have people project their own insecurities or context onto whatever joke that I put in my games and think back on that joke later or to consider why they reacted to it the way they did. For example, in, in Clam Man 2, uh, there's a joke where you interact with a person putting up posters. And this person very clearly has strong political beliefs about the ruling classes. And as a joke, one of the dialogue options is, I'd like to know more about your political views before I agree or disagree with you on this. This is kind of the jokes that I'd like to make, or the, the jokes that I think really work in, in video games, where we kind of make fun of ourselves and how we interact with the world, rather than just saying something is a certain way. Uh, now, regardless of, of what you think about any of this, I'd, I do like to reiterate that typically, in order to make social commentary, we do have to step out of the joke. And that's the issue I feel. That, that's the issue I have with it. And that's kind of why I'm doing the talk. Uh, what's the effect of just sticking to your guns and just deciding that you just want to be funny? Well, this is now where we get to the second part, the practical part of this talk. Uh, hopefully, actually giving you some advice on how to tackle any and all of these things and how to write uh, comedy without feeling like you have to dip into another form of expression or type of expression uh, to say what you want to say. So, the question then becomes, how do I tell an emotional story through jokes? Or how do I tell jokes without being disregarded uh, as just a funny person? Now, this might not sound like a problem, uh, but it's certainly one that I and other devs I've talked to, especially people that work uh, within the comedic genre, uh, have experienced. Now, I call it the, the inverse Whedon or the inverse Marvel problem. Uh, the Marvel problem or the Whedon problem is, uh, if you're not familiar with it, the idea that whenever you have an emotional scene or a very kind of uh, strong narrative moment that shows character development or have your characters open up, you have to kind of undercut it with a joke to detach yourself or just kind of poke fun at the situation. It, it's... Uh, it, it's it's sort of a, an insecurity about how your audience is going to perceive you writing something dramatic or writing something serious and wanting to make sure that people know that, yeah, it's, you know, it's whatever. It's a, don't worry about it. It's just a joke. Now, the inverse that I'm talking about is similar, but it's that the joke is entirely removed. So it's what I mentioned 
uh, previously. It's the fear that in order to have a genuine, heartfelt moment, uh, you cannot include a joke. The idea that whenever a character expresses uh, a deep uh, personal flaw or an issue or a problem or, or just an emotion that they have, you can't turn that into a joke. And the reason I call it the inverse Whedon is that the problem between the Whedon problem, the Marvel problem, and the inverse Whedon Marvel problem is that you're ultimately unhappy or insecure with how a certain emotion is being played out in a scene. You want to have a sweet emotional moment of two characters interacting, but you're worried it's going to feel too saccharine or too forced. So you throw in a joke so both characters and audience can deject from feeling too connected to the moment, or even having to consider the emotions at play in favor of just a quick laugh instead. It is the haha, just kidding of storytelling. And like I said, the inverse of that is completely removing the joke in favor of, of making a statement or, or providing the player with a very clear emotional message. Now, again, it can sound like a non-problem, right? And if it's not a problem to you, that's fine. Keep doing what you do. I'm sure it's amazing in every single way. The issue I have personally with this is, I suppose, on some level, frustration. If comedy and jokes uh, is my chosen medium of writing, why can't I tell a story entirely through jokes? It's, uh, like I said, the inverse is they're right, you know, whenever a comedian tells a joke and makes a point, and you have to point out that, hey, actually, you're making some good points there. It's no longer funny, it's just a statement. Now, all of this connects to what we went over already, it, it's, it's about how comedy affords detachment or relief in these moments uh, where you typically would want connection and immersion in your narrative. Uh, so what are the pros and cons of doing this? Well, first of all, the obvious con is that the emotional payoff might be lost on some people. That's kind of the risk that you take when doing this. The interesting part about that, I think, is that you're essentially setting yourself up to the same risk if you decide to go the non-comedic route. Uh, some people might still write it off as sickly sweet nonsense to serve the plot, or even worse, they might be cynical about it and feel that it's an attempt to just kind of add dramatic merit to your work. Because art and comedy are subjective, you're never going to be able to escape that. Uh, how about the pros then? Well, it makes for an interesting narrative challenge. And personally, I massively enjoy when I'm playing a game and a narrative beat plays out in an unexpected way. I'm not talking about a story twist, but rather how a scene or a section of gameplay plays out for the same emotional payoff, but differently from how we're used to seeing it. It, it, it breeds innovation. Uh, a good example of this uh, non-comedic, for example, is the movie Hot Fuzz. In Hot Fuzz, one of the characters is forced to travel to a very small town outside of what they consider to be civilization or where they're useful, uh, from London to a very small English village. Now, typically in a Hollywood movie, what we'd see during a travel montage is just a camera panning over a car driving, landmarks, a little bit of music to show that, okay, they're traveling. In Hot Fuzz, that's depicted in a this kind of quick montage with uh, service on the main character's mobile phone slowly dropping, uh, days and nights passing. Uh, he stops at smaller and smaller train stations. Uh, it's turned into a joke. It becomes funny, and it's a it's a very interesting and engaging way of showing that passage of time. And then finally, as a pro. There's no genre whiplash. And it might be that maybe your game or your style of writing, for example, doesn't lend itself well to, say, romance. So rather than shoehorning in a moment that you only really know is intended to be romantic payoff, uh, you expect it to be it. You want it to be it, and you're kind of falling into the habit of, well, that's how this is usually done. That could break the flow of the rest of your work if your writing doesn't work with that kind of romance. So sometimes it might be better to just kind of stay in your lane and do what you do best. Uh, don't add the sudden drama, horror, or stylistic twists just because it's what expected of you or what you expect of yourself in that narrative circumstance. You can be bold and you can stick to your guns. So, 
what's the solution? How do we actually do this? Um, the less interesting answer is to just put it, put in the work. Uh, it takes a lot more time and effort to do things like this, I think. But in the end, you're left with a more interesting way of handling that emotional payoff. Now, the more interesting answer is obviously, what are some practical ways of doing this? And the good news is that there's a lot of ways that you can do it, especially afforded by games. And I'm going to be going over some examples that have helped me throughout development. And I think hopefully can help you as well if you're working in comedy games. So example number one, or solution number one, the bard option. Uh, this one's a lot of fun because in a way it lets everybody involved have their own fun. Uh, the bard option is a topic that I did talk about uh, for wordplay uh, a while back. And it's named after bards in tabletop role-playing games, such as Dungeons and Dragons, uh, where it's the dialogue option that's the silliest or the weirdest or most outlandish uh, that you can find. And typically the one that the bard says, because they're the most jovial and silly character in the party. Uh, like I said, it lets everybody enjoy it. Uh, you as a writer are able to provide a a, a fun and strange option in emotional moments uh, through multiple dialogue choices, for example, while the player is provided with that choice, but also with the agency to either engage with it or not engage with it. Uh, so for example, let's say a character in your game tells the main character, the player character, I love you. And you then give the player these four options. One, I love you too. Two, I'm not ready for this. Three, I'm sorry, I don't feel the same. And four, oh man, love, that's, yeah, that's definitely an emotion. The fourth option is, if it's not obvious, is the bard option. It's the, the silly line. And it's there not just to present a comical path forward, which, make no mistake, it has to be. If the player chooses that option, you have to provide them with a silly, kind of jovial, jokey way through the rest of that dialogue, they can still connect emotionally. But the beauty of the bard option is that even if the player doesn't choose it, you have non-diegetically told a joke to the player. Uh, so if I'm reading dialogue options and there is a bard option in there, me as a player can laugh at that joke and just think like, why would I choose that? Or why would I pick that? Or that's stupid or that's silly and laugh at it. It also allows me to, if I don't choose that option, just ignore it canonically. It's not part of the narrative. It, it, it lets me as a developer crack a joke at the player while ensuring that they don't have to pursue it, but they can also lighten the mood or get a chuckle out of it just by seeing it. So the summary is here is just make the joke canonically optional. You can tell jokes to the player that you present as choices, but not necessarily a uh, path forward that they're going to want to do. Uh, the ha second half of this is letting the player be funny. So having the joke canonically optional, but also letting the player be the weird one. Usually games place you in a world where everything's bizarre and strange and they have jokes that they can laugh at, but with the bard option, the player has some agency to be the funny one. They can pick the unexpected option and they can see the unexpected results of that. So it works on two levels. It's a joke when you see it, but it's also a joke when the player realizes that, oh, this is a valid path forward. And they're surprised by whatever silly dialogue comes next, whatever jokes you want to crack at the end of that. So that's solution number one, or, or mechanical, practical solution to this problem number one. Moving on to the next one, subvert your framing. Uh, like I touched on briefly before, subversion is the mother of all jokes. And uh, this is a very typical approach in tragic comedies or dark comedies. And basically, it is that if the narrative content of your scene is dramatic, frame it as comedic, frame it in a ridiculous manner. And if the narrative content of your scene is comedic, frame it in a serious manner. This is just comedy 101, uh, but it bears repeating because I think in comedy games, this is underutilized. 
especially when it comes to strong emotional or, or central narrative moments. So uh, as an example, uh, two characters are in love. Uh, one of them is from a rich family of aristocrats, and the other is from a working class family uh, of lower social status in the eyes of the, the other family. Now, the main character, halfway through the story, or towards the end, decides that they don't care. And they have this long and emotional interaction where they declare they love, and they say, I don't care about what you do, I don't care where you're from, I don't care about the money, I just care about you, I love you. And they cry, and they kiss, and all is well. And it's, it's very typical, and we've seen it a million times. Now, we can write that dialogue, but frame it differently. We can zoom out for the audience. So let's say that the reason that the rich family doesn't like the, the poor family is because, not because they're poor, but because they work as circus clowns or as birthday clowns for kids' birthday parties. And the rich family hates this, obviously. Uh, for whatever reason. Uh, but the main character still decides that they love them. And they end up crashing a random child's birthday party in full clown makeup. Now, the characters still have that same long emotional interaction. You can even have the exact same dialogue that you would have in the first options. But now they're both in full clown makeup. So every time one of them moves, there's a honk. Every time they cry, their makeup turns into this awful sludge-like mess on their faces that they're wiping off and it becomes more and more horrifying by the second the children are watching and screaming in horror as these two colorful monsters eventually just kind of smush their faces together and kiss uh, the parents get angry they beat up these two people whatever you get to keep the emotional dialogue that you worked some hard on and you let the characters fully believe it but the scene when viewed at from the outside by the player, by the audience, is funny. It's an interaction of, or it's a, it's a reaction of, uh, of going. This is awful. It's, it's really sweet, but it's awful. Why is it like this? Oh God! Oh, oh, oh God! Now they're melting. It lets you take a step back while still having that emotional moment, but playing it off as a joke on the surface. So, that's the second part: subverting your framing. Thirdly, manage expectations. This is a lot of a stated problem narratively within your game and more of a latent issue with the genre. And this stems from the expectation of the joke. Uh, imagine a situation where you're introduced to somebody at a party and the person introducing you says, oh, this is X, Y, Z. They're really funny. And the response from the other person is, oh, you're funny? Say something funny. Tell us a joke. You are now doomed to fail. It doesn't matter what joke you tell. It will never be as funny as what they expect. Because the people you're telling this joke to know that you're supposedly funny. And they're going to compare you to every other funny thing they've heard in their life. The funniest things they've ever heard. That's what they're going to be comparing you to. This is where uh, comedy games have a really hard time. You're setting yourself up for failure just by calling your work a comedy game. Now, that's not to say that comedy games don't exist or can't be done well, but if you bill yourself as one, you're going to be met with a tremendous amount of expectation or judgment. Uh, it's the same way as horror games can experience this. Uh, if you say that your horror game is the scariest game of all time or an incredibly terrifying game in general, even if you call it psychological horror, people will now compare that to certain things and they will have an expectation that will be scary. And ultimately, if a joke or a scare doesn't work as well as it was supposed to, those prejudices are now coming into reality. They're coming true. And the player will be like, yeah, it's not as good as they said it would be. But it's not just the difficulty in subverting your writing after the player is made aware that they're playing a comedy game. It's also that comedy games can have negative connotations. And this is similar to the horror game example I brought up, which is that there is no gameplay. Now, this may or may not be true. Uh, depends on your definition of gameplay, obviously. Uh, but it can very quickly turn people off from your game. Interactivity is a very, very important part uh, of games to, to me and to a lot of players. And 
even if that's just in the form of making rudimentary choices throughout the narrative. The thing is, they can incorrectly assume it, that when you use the term comedy game, you are using the term comedy game as a mechanical genre for the game, rather than a stylistic one. So the solution to this is simple. Uh, it's don't market yourself as a comedy game. Uh, and I use the word market there for a reason, because it, you need to avoid that term on online storefronts or in any situation where you're selling the game or trying to get people to play the game. Because chances are, if you're making an absurdist game, the setting or story of your game is obviously funny. Uh, it's obviously funny enough for the player to assume it's going to be a humorous game. Uh, you need to believe in your own weirdness. So I have a personal example for this, for example, for Clan Man 2, the original kind of elevator pitch I used for the game was, it's a game where jokes are loot and comedy shows are boss fights. And I called it very clearly a comedy RPG, a jokey RPG, a funny RPG. And that just doesn't land because you're making a, a statement that this game will cause or elicit a certain emotional reaction and you're going to be judged on that every step of the way i got tired of pitching the game like that and one day i was just done with it and i remember tweeting out something like uh, making a comedy game about a clam that quits his job and becomes a stand-up comedian instead and that's way better that's me actually believing in the narrative that i'm telling in my game i believe in how weird it is and i'm confident in that by just saying that players are going to assume that this might be funny even if the reaction is just okay that sounds super weird i kind of want to play this that's way 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 better than oh a comedy game oh it's oh, okay so it's supposed to be funny is it funny are, are there jokes is it good don't mark yourself as a comedy game never never ever just say what your game is about and believe in it fully Speaking of believing, the fourth step is believing in your own joke. Now, like I said, not everybody will think you're funny, and that's fine. Art and comedy is subjective. Not You're not going to get everybody. There's always going to be somebody who either doesn't get your joke or doesn't think it's very funny. The thing is, you can never engage the people that think you're unfunny. Never, ever, no matter how much you want to, never explain the joke to these people. Because if they didn't get it the first time, it's not going to be funny when you explain it. So just leave it be. Just consider it as, all right, you can't get everybody. And that's fine. That's good. As soon as you start explaining it, you come across as desperate. You come across as insecure in your own joke. The joke needed to be funny for you. You're writing comedy for yourself as much as you're writing it for anybody else. So just let it go. It's fine. Don't worry about it. Secondly, never say that I'm not funny. Never even hint at it. Never say that your jokes are bad. Uh, I see this a lot uh, online and in games. Uh, and I think one of the most typical things that I see is you make a bad joke and you say, ha ha ha, uh, I'll see myself out. It's not funny. It's never been funny. Stop doing this. Everybody, never ever say that. Can we stop saying that collectively as a human species? It's not funny. And even worse, when you say that, when you admit to any level that your joke isn't funny, it's blood in the water. People will come for you and they will tell you it's not funny. Or they will start thinking, even if they're supportive, that maybe it wasn't that funny. I used to do stand-up way, way back, and I remember still from one of the first shows that I did, uh, one of the bits that I had, because uh, my routine was very self-deprecating, was saying that I'm not a very funny person, and so's and so's. Show went okay, and I got off stage, and this older comedian came up to me, and, and he said, good set, never do that, never ever, because if you even hint at it, if you plant a seed that you are not funny, then people will start believing it. Uh, next, believe every single word you say, no matter how stupid it might be, and just let it slide if it doesn't land. 
this is a great thing about games in general is usually comedy games are single player games uh the comedy games that i'm talking about at least are single player games they're experiences that you play alone or maybe you stream for a friend or play together with a friend but they are ongoing the pace will always to some extent be on the player so if a joke doesn't land don't worry about it not every joke is going to land and in fact sometimes it's better that not every joke lands you need this kind of roller coaster uh, kind of quality of level uh, a level of quality on your jokes as you tell them because if you're constantly telling great jokes the threshold for laughter will rise and if you're constantly telling bad jokes the threshold will lower so you go for a soft joke a soft joke and a great joke and after that you can dip down again and that's okay just games and text in games uh, pass by quickly you don't need to linger on it. You don't need to worry about it. Just don't say, I'll see myself out. Just don't draw attention to it. Just keep going. So, in summary, let the player opt into your jokes. Let them decide for themselves uh, how funny they want to be. And if they want to be funny, let the player be funny. Again, mechanical comedy games do this well. Narrative comedy games can do this well. I, I, I truly believe so. You just need to be better at, at subverting things and giving the player unexpected uh, solutions and, and reactions and consequences to what they do in their games. Frame your scenes. Change things up. Don't fall into the trap of just assuming this is a dramatic scene so it can't be funny or this is a funny scene so it can't be dramatic. There are ways. You can shift things around, you can twist things around, and you can get a laugh out of just about everything. Even if the laugh comes three days after the scene, when you think back on it and you think about that was absurd, ridiculous, that was funny, even if the moment it isn't. Manage expectations. Don't call yourself a comedy game. Don't let yourself out ever. Just believe in what you're doing and believe in the joke and believe that at least if you think it's funny, somebody else will. And finally, remember why you're doing it. So initially this talk had a, a slide and a long conversation about validation and why we seek it and why we want it. And ultimately, I don't think there's much I can say there that's interesting to anybody. I think validation in general comes in a series of different ways. It's it's personal self-expression it's it's uh, improving at your craft it's connecting with other people uh, and unfortunately it's also about gaining critical acclaim and commercial acclaim because unfortunately games and working in games is a very commercial medium but don't forget that you are telling jokes because you want to tell jokes and you want to make people laugh not everybody's gonna laugh and that's fine. As long as you're happy doing it, and as long as you're enjoying doing it, and as long as you can do a one-hour talk about you don't have to be serious, you can be funny instead. If you care about it, that's ultimately all that matters. That's the end of the talk. So, uh, thank you all so much uh, for listening. If you made it all the way to the end, you have my eternal gratitude for listening in on this, which is, I understand, is an incredibly niche talk. Uh, but hopefully, at least there's one person out there that will get something out of this or, or feel like they've learned something or taken something to heart that they can implement in their own games. I would love to do questions, uh, but since I'm not there in person, I'm unable to do so. So if there's something in this talk that you really liked or even really hated feel free to reach out to me on twitter and my handle is marifras and uh, if you want to have a look at some of these principles in action uh, you can check out clan man 2 open mic which is a prologue for clan man 2 headliner which is free on steam right now you can play it and maybe you'll think it's funny maybe you'll laugh that's all from me uh, thank you all again so much and i hope you have a great rest of the day rest of the weekend rest of the week, whatever. Have a good one.